lecture, I'm going to look, as you can see, at ministerial responsibility and uh, to some extent as it provides a good illustration of a source of the British Constitution uh, at uh, constitutional conventions. But we'll be mainly concerned with uh, ministerial responsibility. Uh, so what is that? Uh, ministerial responsibility is used to describe a set or cluster of constitutional conventions. Not a single one, but uh, a group of them. Uh, and these uh, are particularly important constitutional conventions because they're very central to relationships within the British Constitution. The conventions involved, uh, as is quite typical, have developed over a long period of time, in this case over more than 200 years, uh, and they don't depend on being written down anywhere. It's sometimes said that constitutional conventions are part of the unwritten uh, Constitution. In fact, that's not quite as true as it used to be because there are a number of places where conventions are to be found in a written form. And uh, in this instance, uh, you will find them, along with a whole lot of other things, it has to be said, uh, in a document called the Ministerial Code. Uh, so that's not a, not a group of legal rules, but it is a written down uh, code. It is a formulation of constitutional conventions, along with a whole lot of other procedures and uh, instructions to people who are ministers. The ministerial code uh, is issued by the Prime Minister, usually at the start of a new parliament or a new government. Mr Cameron chose to uh, issue a different one uh, in 2015, last year, uh, slightly different from the one that he'd issued uh, when he was uh, the Prime Minister in a coalition government. So that led to uh, one or two, not many, uh, changes. The ministerial code was originally uh, published under another name, and it was originally not published at all, but it's been published, it's been available to the public since uh, 1992. Now to uh, expand the concept a little bit more fully, um, let's notice that ministerial responsibility is responsibility to Parliament. It is a link or a connection, uh, an interaction between the legislature and the executive. Uh, and ministerial responsibility depends on some premises, uh, some of which are, are quite uh, easy and familiar to you, but uh, are, are in fact important features of the British Constitution uh, that differentiate it from some others. The British Constitution has a parliamentary executive. That would not be the case in the USA, where the president is not part of the legislature congress. But uh, many countries in the world do have a parliamentary executive, uh, some of them perhaps influenced by or to some extent copying Britain, if that's not too, not too arrogant or, or optimistic. I, I myself, I, I know that the study guide and some other things refer to the Westminster model. Well, I, I tend not to like that phrase very much because I'm not entirely sure what the Westminster model connotes. But it is certainly true that uh, uh, some other con constitutions are quite heavily based or at least are quite similar to uh, aspects of the British Constitution. Exactly which aspects would fall within the Westminster model, I think, is not quite so clear, which is why I, I perhaps don't like the, uh, the phrase as much uh, as some others. So we have a parliamentary executive. Notice that in Britain we don't elect the Prime Minister. We don't elect the government, do we? We, we elect MPs. And by the working of certain understandings and conventions and practices, uh, some of those, uh, and a few other people, become the government. Uh, but we don't directly elect the government. So ministerial responsibility has the importance that it, it provides this democratic mechanism, this link between the elections that we have, which is elections to the House of Commons, uh, along with the, uh, the executive uh, government. So it is itself a convention. It's not usually thought of as part of ministerial responsibility as such, but it is a very strongly connected convention that is that ministers must sit in Parliament. Uh, it is expected that all ministers are found in one or other of the Houses of Parliament. The vast majority of them, and this would also be a convention, must be found in the House of Commons. But some ministers may be found in the House of Lords. If you had too many, who were found in the House of Lords, that would be a breach of convention. That would not be regarded as an acceptable thing for the Prime Minister in suggesting appointments to the Queen 
who formally makes them, uh, that would not be uh, an acceptable thing to do. So that's what we would call unconstitutional. In the UK, when we use the word unconstitutional, we're talking about something being contrary to constitutional convention. Whereas in other countries that have a written constitution, the, as in the USA or Germany, the word unconstitutional would also include the idea that it is illegal going against the law of the constitution. But we use the word in a somewhat different way uh, in Britain. So a parliamentary executive is one of the premises. Uh, and another of the uh, premises that we have here uh, is in relation to the separation of powers. Now my colleague here today, Eloise Ellis, will be uh, talking much more about this uh, later in the day. But uh, the separation of powers in its pure or absolute form would require a complete separation of legislature, executive and judiciary, as I'm sure you know. By having a parliamentary executive, then clearly the philosophy in Britain is not to adopt that pure form of the separation of powers. It is a deliberate rejection of that pure form of the separation of powers. Well, one of the problems of the separation of powers, as with that other general principle, the rule of law, is that it can mean a whole lot of different things, and it can mean different things to different people. And uh, a different form of the separation of powers is one that encourages or advises uh, the fostering of checks and balances. And the idea of checks and balances is that elements of the legislature may also act in some way as a check or balance or control on what is done by the executive or the judiciary and vice versa. So that the three institutions are not completely separated with walls between them, uh, but have various links and connections and controls running between them. Uh, and certainly it would be true to say that that version, which in some ways is an opposite, but that version of the separation of powers is one that uh, is given some effect to uh, in the British Constitution. And with ministerial responsibility, we see a good example of that. So ministerial responsibility is uh, providing us with the opportunity where Parliament, which is also the place where the legislature meets and acts, but it is also the forum or the arena in which the government, that very powerful institution, is held to account. It is the primary place where they are held to account in political terms. They may be held to account in a different way in the courts by judicial means, but that will only apply where the executive has or is thought to be perhaps acting in a way that is unlawful. The courts are only dealing with legality. Questions of politics or merits or choices, which may be more important in many aspects, well, these are things that are perhaps only dealt with or certainly best dealt with in Parliament. So Parliament provides the forum and the arena where there is the mechanism for governments to be held politically accountable. If you wanted to challenge British uh, government's decision to send forces to Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that, you probably wouldn't get very far in the courts. There might be issues of international law, but British courts are not there to adjudicate on issues of international law. Much more important would be debates in the House of Commons and uh, select committees considering the matter and things of that sort. So Parliament would provide the political accountability for decisions of that kind to be made. So I've touched uh, there in the way going on some of the functions that ministerial responsibility has. It uh, provides for some democratic and popular control of government between election times. When the ultimate control is uh, if people are not happy with uh, what the government is doing, if they uh, if people don't think that uh, the government should be uh, carrying out these foreign adventures or if they think that the government is uh, carrying austerity too far when it should be increasing spending on welfare or health or infrastructure or something else, then, well, at least every five years we have the chance to chuck that government out and have a different lot instead. So that's the ultimate uh, democratic control. But five years is quite a long time. One prime British <coughs> Prime Minister said a week is a long time in politics, so five years is a very long time in politics. And so uh, ministerial responsibility and the functions of Parliament uh, are important in that intervening period 
uh, of five years. The ministerial responsibility uh, means that the government is answering for what it does to the elected representatives of the people in the House of Commons. Government policy has to be explained. It is, uh, has to be identified. The government has to say what they're doing. They have to say why they're doing it. They have to uh, explain and justify that policy as against possible alternatives. And so in many respects, uh, we would uh, think that ministerial responsibility serves some very useful functions, that it is good uh, for supporters of limited government and supporters of democracy, uh, that the government has to answer for what it's doing, uh, and these are important benefits. But we should also perhaps just notice that things can be a little bit more ambivalent or can sometimes go in other directions as well. There is also some downside in the doctrines of ministerial responsibility. In some of its aspects, ministerial responsibility is aimed more at strengthening and protecting governments. How does it do that? Well, it does that, we, we'll see the details uh, as we go on, but it does that to some extent by assisting or encouraging governments to keep things confidential, at least to a degree, uh, and by encouraging or assisting governments to keep a united front. So as well as being a sword by which representatives on behalf of the public uh, are using Parliament as the place where government is held to account, ministerial responsibility to extend the metaphor can sometimes be used rather as a shield than as a sword where the government itself uses its majority in the commons. By definition, governments will normally have a majority in the commons because that's how uh, the Queen decides who should be Prime Minister. It is the person best able to command a majority in the House of Commons, usually the leader of the largest party, but not necessarily. The convention properly expressed is that the Queen chooses the person best able to command a majority in the House of Commons. And so by definition, a government, of course, things may change. It might need to go into coalition. It might lose seats in by-elections. And what was a majority government might become a minority government. All of these things can happen. But generally speaking, by definition, a government hopes and expects to have a majority in the House of Commons in order to be able to govern effectively, uh, to get its legislation through, and things of that kind. And so sometimes when we look at the doctrines of ministerial responsibility, sometimes we'll find that as well as it being a sword against governments, it can sometimes be used as a shield by governments in, in a rather different way, either to protect themselves en bloc uh, or to protect individual members of the government. The government may use its majority to throw this shield or protection around what it's doing at the same time as ministerial responsibility in other ways is providing the sword by which the government uh, can be put to challenge. Now, ministerial responsibility, as I'm sure you know, breaks down into two main parts, which are collective responsibility and individual responsibility. And those two main branches themselves break down into different strands, uh, again, as I'm sure you know. So we're beginning by looking at collective responsibility, and it uh, breaks down into three uh, different strands or subdivisions, which uh, let us uh, think a little bit about each of these. Quite often uh, in exam answers that I've seen over the years, people oversimplify this and think that collective responsibility is just about one of these. You know, one of these is perhaps the most obvious to you, but actually there are three. Uh, strands of collective responsibility uh, are there not. So the first of these is uh, the confidence principle. And here the uh, doctrine developed, especially after 1832 with the extension of the vote, the extension of the franchise to uh, a wider part of the community at least. It took a long time for it to extend to all adults including women. That was going to take another uh, 80 or 90 years after 1832, but uh, it at least uh, was a process that began to be taken more seriously from that date. And then the House of Commons gradually became more important than the House of Lords, and it also gradually became apparent that a government would only survive or should only survive as a government if it retained the ability 
to put important measures through the House of Commons at least and probably through uh, Parliament as a whole. So that's what lies behind the confidence principle. The convention by the 19th century was that a government should resign and or advise the dissolution of Parliament, meaning a new general election and a different Parliament. Usually those came to the same thing. Uh, uh, but the, these should happen in either of two circumstances. Either when a specific motion was put in the Commons as to whether the House had confidence in His Majesty's or Her Majesty's government. It could be put either way. It could be someone on the government side uh, wishing to emphasize that that confidence is still retained. Or more likely, and more often, it was somebody on the other side to say that uh, this House no longer has confidence in Her Majesty's government. Either way, that's a motion of confidence. And if a government was defeated on such a motion, if it lost on the vote following that motion, then the expectation from the convention was, as I said, the Prime Minister would either resign or would advise a dissolution of the whole Parliament uh, to the King or Queen. But in the 19th century, there was a second uh, circumstance or alternative. In the 19th century, it was also assumed that a defeat on any major policy item should also lead to that same sanction or consequence of resigning or advising a dissolution. So the government losing a vote on some important matter of principle, something in a budget speech, some important decision in foreign affairs, something of that kind, uh, also sparked off uh, the sanction in exactly the same way. However, at some stage, and with conventions it's often not possible to put an exact date on it, but at some stage in the uh, last uh, 60 years, uh, that clearly had begun to change. In the 1960s and 1970s, when there were governments headed by Mr. Wilson for Labour or Mr. Heath for the Conservatives, uh, those governments often had quite small majorities, you know, maybe five or 10 or 20 seats uh, majority over other parties. And uh, the risk might have been that uh, you know, governments would be very short-lived and there would have to be a lot of elections or something like that. So actually both Mr. Wilson for Labour and Mr. Heath for the Conservatives both said, well, I'm not going to feel that I have to resign if we lose a vote on anything. I will only feel that I have to resign if we lose a vote on a, a question of confidence. So the convention had actually changed and the bit about major policy items uh, had left uh, by some stage in the 1960s or 70s. So in a, almost in, in colluding on this, the main parties had in a sense agreed or at any rate by their actions were taking the view that there had been a change and the application of the convention was narrowed uh, in that way so as to apply only to specific motions of confidence. Well, it still applies there. The last time it uh, actually happened in that way was quite a while back now, in 1979. Uh, Labour was in power. The Prime Minister following Harold Wilson's uh, retirement uh, was Jim Callaghan. Uh, but uh, the government, which in 1974 had started with a small majority of seats, by 1978-79 had actually lost its overall majority because of by-election defeats. Labour had lost some seats to, to other parties. So it was not altogether a surprise that eventually their uh, luck would run out, so to speak. All of the other parties, if, they all, if all of the other parties ganged up against them and voted against them on a motion of confidence, they would lose. And that eventually happened uh, in 1979. That's pretty near the end of a five-year parliament anyway, uh, but it eventually happened then. And Mr. Callaghan, following convention uh, straight away, goes off to Buckingham Palace and uh, advises the Queen to dissolve parliament so that a general election would be held. So the uh, convention still operates. That was the last particular use we saw of it, but it's quite clear that the convention itself is in its narrowed form uh, still in good health. Some of you may have wondered whether the Act passed in 2011, the Fixed Term Parliaments Act 2011, slightly clumsy name for an act, isn't it? Uh, but this was an act which, as the title, short title implies, this is a, an act which uh, makes it the rule that uh, parliaments will normally have a fixed term of five years, uh, except in one or two 
uh, exceptional circumstances. But no, and notice that this act, uh, although it removes the royal prerogative of dissolution of parliament, which is replaced by the terms of the act, uh, this act doesn't actually affect the convention that we've been talking about. It is still the case that the Prime Minister will, will be expected to resign if they lose on a vote of confidence. Uh, what happens afterwards is then affected by the terms of the Act, and basically it's affected most obviously in the way that there's then a period of 14 days when someone else may see whether they can uh, have sufficient uh, votes to win on a motion of confidence and form a different government. So that could happen. But that, as I say, does not affect the terms of the Convention itself. It affects the consequences that might happen uh, afterwards if there were uh, a resignation on that count. Okay, moving on. The uh, second principle, uh, second strand within collective responsibility, and this is the one that everyone most easily remembers, perhaps, but as I'm trying to show only one of the three, actually. Uh, the second strand is the unanimity principle, and uh, basically what uh, lies behind this is the requirement that all ministers who are part of the government uh, must treat decisions by the government as binding. They must fall in behind them in order to show solidarity. Notice that uh, in my formulation here it says all ministers. It doesn't say cabinet ministers. Quite a common mistake, often made even by people who should know better, is to call it cabinet ministerial responsibility or cabinet responsibility. It's not just for the cabinet, which numbers just a little bit over 20 people. It's for the whole government. How many ministers are there in the government? Well, there's probably going to be something like 110 or 115 ministers. That's including junior ministers in the government. How do we get to that figure? Well, we get to that figure because there's a limit a maximum, a cap, on the number who can be given ministerial salaries while they are MPs under the House of Commons Disqualification Act 1975. That doesn't apply to someone in the House of Lords. So you might add another 10 or 15 or at most maybe 20 people uh, who are in the House of Lords and are ministers. If a Prime Minister wants someone to be made a minister who is not currently a member of either House of Parliament, that's not difficult. All that they do is uh, that the Prime Minister makes that nomination to the Queen to suggest that that person be appointed to the House of Lords. But as I've already indicated, you couldn't do that with, uh, you know, you couldn't add uh, 500 people uh, as government ministers and put them all in the House of Lords. Uh, that would not be regarded as proper or acceptable. That would be unconstitutional. Okay, but it applies to all ministers, so uh, to uh, at least a hundred people. In fact, the, the unanimity here is even extended to people who are technically not ministers, who are PPSs, parliamentary private secretaries, sometimes rather dismissively called ministerial bag carriers. The idea being that uh, if the uh, minister has to uh, you know, have a, a handbag uh, or an umbrella or something like that, then uh, these are people that will actually you know, do these fairly menial tasks and uh, book hotels and taxis and, uh, and hold the umbrella while the minister is being uh, filmed on TV and things of that sort. Um, and it, this is in a sense regarded as an early step or the first rung on the ministerial ladder, but actually it's not technically on the ministerial ladder at all. There's no salary that goes with such a post. But if they do that and they behave themselves, then they might hope that they, next time round when there's a reshuffle and an appointment of new ministers, they might hope to be figuring in that and be given a junior ministerial role on their climb up the ladder or the greasy pole, as it's sometimes called. So it even applies in that situation. So a PPS could be sacked from being a PPS. They'll still be an MP, but they could be sacked from being a PPS they're not losing any salary because they didn't get any salary as a PPS. But they could be sacked from that if they vote against the government on an issue that is whipped, on an issue where the government uh, has asked its followers to vote in a particular way. You know that the way in which the whip system operates is that the party leaders and managers uh, decide whether on a particular issue they expect their party members in Parliament to vote in a particular way or not. Each party makes its own decision on that. 
you may have a situation sometimes where one party is applying the party whip and expects its uh, MPs, and equally in the House of Lords, although it operates less uh, strongly there, uh, one party might expect its followers to vote in a particular way where the other party, the other main party might say, no, we don't mind on this. You can vote how you like according to your, your conscience. So uh, that's what we have anyway with the unanimity principle. Now it follows that uh, um, those government ministers who are not happy with uh, decisions by the government uh, cannot uh, diverge or express disagreement unless they are prepared to leave the government, unless they are prepared either to resign or be sacked. I don't draw any great distinction, you may notice, between resigning and being sacked because it's not always clear which is which. If a minister is being sacked, the way in which the Prime Minister will do it is to ask that person to send him a resignation letter. It looks better and the letter will be published and it's not, ne not necessarily clear to the public whether the person has been sacked or whether the minister has chosen to resign. So the two things collapse into one really, resignation and sacking here. Uh, public dissent or difference then is going to lead to dismissal or resignation, same effect. And uh, there are instances of that from time to time, depending on the solidarity and popularity that the government is able to command amongst its own members. Uh, just to mention a couple of uh, well-known examples, back in 1986, a minister called Michael Heseltine, one of the few uh, living uh, cabinet ministers from the Thatcher years, uh, Michael Heseltine uh, was uh, something of an opponent to Mrs. Thatcher in some respects. The particular matter here was over the rescue of a British helicopter company. Sounds maybe a rather strange thing to be a resigning uh, matter. But uh, a company called Westland in the west of England was a helicopter maker, including uh, military helicopters. The company fell into financial trouble. There was a possibility of rescue through a tie-up with an American company. There was another possibility of rescue through connections or a tie-up with European companies. And two ministers, Mr. Leon Britton uh, and Michael Heseltine, took very divergent views on this. Mrs. Thatcher's own view, she was the Prime Minister, and she took the view in a very hands-off way that actually was nothing to do with governments anyway. If a company goes to the wall, a company goes to the wall, was really her attitude, at least uh, publicly expressed. Well, there came a time when uh, the differences between Heseltine and Britain over the possible solutions were becoming aired in the media, were becoming rather too public, and so it was beginning to look a bit embarrassing for the government, this open display of dissent. And so Mrs. Thatcher lost patience and eventually said, well, there'll be no more said about this uh, at Cabinet or anywhere else. And at a Cabinet meeting in uh, 10 Downing Street, uh, Mr. Heseltine uh, asked if this could be raised on the agenda, uh, and to which Mrs. Thatcher said, it's not on the agenda, next item. Uh, Michael Heseltine then dramatically walked straight out of the Cabinet and out into Downing Street, where of course there's always cameras waiting, just like here, there's always cameras waiting to uh, catch uh, photographs of ministers as they walk out of the meeting. And he walks straight over to the camera and gives his resignation speech publicly and on air, uh, very dramatically in that way. As I say, it doesn't seem like a major policy issue and probably it was a little bit tied up with issues of personality as well, or political ambitions. But that's, uh, uh, that's uh, one way of looking at it, uh, at least. Uh, another well-known and more recent uh, couple of resignations would be over uh, British action, military action involving the forces in Iraq. And in 2003, two of uh, Labour's cabinet ministers, Robin Cook and Claire Short, uh, both decided within a month or so of each other that they were not prepared to tolerate the British government's uh, actions. Uh, without the support of a United Nations resolution, which they would have liked to have seen specific UN authority for what Britain was doing. Uh, the uh, government uh, had uh, tr made some attempt to, to obtain that, but unsuccessfully the uh, action continued. Uh, Short and Cook, having originally gone along with it, but on that somewhat unhappy uh, basis, uh, eventually after a few months they decided, no, uh, we've had enough of this, we can't support it anymore. And once they leave the government, then <coughs> traditionally they're given some time in the House of Commons to, uh, to make their case and to explain exactly why 
they were unhappy with some aspect of government uh, policy. Those resignation speeches are sometimes uh, very uh, damaging and very cutting to uh, the Prime Minister of the day, as was, for example, Sir Geoffrey Howes when he left uh, the Thatcher government. It was probably the first nail in Mrs. Thatcher's political coffin uh, that his uh, speech was so uh, vitriolic and damaging. Anyway, that's the general position. Now, notice an important uh, exception to this is that uh, there are situations where uh, a government or its leader, the Prime Minister, realises that it's not going to be possible to maintain that facade of solidarity or unity. And uh, what you have then is described in the phrase, an agreement to differ, uh, where there is an officially agreed or sanctioned understanding uh, that it is going to be allowed to ministers, usually only for a short period of time and only under certain conditions, uh, but uh, it may sometimes be necessary in order to keep the government together at all to allow this uh, limited, measured, but tolerated degree of dissent. That happened in 1932 when there was a national government with Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald and there were disagreements on issues of trade tariffs. It uh, happened uh, more uh, relevantly and uh, more recently in 1975 in 1975, the Labour Party had uh, recently fought a general election with a promise or commitment that if Labour became the government, they would seek to renegotiate terms with the European communities uh, and put those renegotiated terms or the results of those to the electorate in a referendum, giving the British people, who had not had the chance to uh, vote on the matter in 1972, when the UK joined the European communities, but in 1975, so two or three years later, uh, Mr. Wilson's Labour government took the position uh, that there should be that opportunity. He would promised it in a manifesto before the general election. Now, Labour itself was uh, badly uh, divided. Uh, Sixteen of Wilson's cabinet at the time were in favour of remaining in the European communities, but seven of them were against and very uh, strongly uh, anti uh, including uh, some big figures uh, like Michael Foote and Tony Benn. Uh, and so uh, really this was, uh, uh, I think Harold Wilson is possibly being sort of slightly re-rated at the moment as having been quite a clever Prime Minister in a very difficult time. And this was one of his techniques for uh, helping to keep together uh, a fairly divided party with some big beasts uh, uh, amongst it, some other uh, powerful people uh, in it. And so, all of this may be beginning to sound a little bit familiar. Uh, so what Mr. Wilson decided was that there would be a limited period of time in the run-up to that referendum uh, when ministers would be allowed, uh, under the terms that he announced, uh, would be allowed to express different views on the question of the UK's uh, remaining in the European communities, as it was then, uh, under these renegotiated terms, uh, or, or of leaving. The compromise that he came up with then was to allow uh, uh, opposition to be expressed to government policy. Government policy was that the renegotiation had been sufficiently successful. Again, this may sound familiar, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and so the UK should stay in. But they were allowed to express different views uh, from uh, members of this government if they chose to. They were not allowed to express different views in the House of Commons. And one of them, Eric Heffer, who expressed a different view in the House of Commons, was then sacked. Uh, there, there's a slight difference. Mr. Cameron's uh, decision on this matter uh, is, uh, is very similar in almost all of those respects. There's not quite such a wide division in the Conservative Party at the moment. Well, it's pretty wide division in the Conservative Party, but in Mr. Cameron's cabinet, there are only five members of the cabinet. Sometimes it's said six, but Priti Patel is not uh, fully a cabinet member. She's a person who attends cabinet meetings, but not a cabinet member. So there are five or six of the uh, Conservative cabinet at the moment who uh, will be Brexit supporters uh, and voters, but uh, the, the others are accepting the government line. Uh, but Mr Cameron's instructions, and uh, partly laid down by the cabinet secretary as well, uh, his instructions were on this were that following a cabinet meeting after the terms were negotiated, that cabinet meeting was on the 20th of February, it was actually on a Saturday, 
uh, Saturday the 20th of February. As soon as Mr Cameron had completed what he regarded as the uh, agreement, uh, then uh, after that date uh, the ministers in his government, members of his government, would be free to express different views. And there's no particular uh, rule about whether that may be in the Commons. So they can be in different views in the Commons as well as in public speeches and the newspapers and other things. Anyway, many of the many parallels, as you can see, many of these events from 1975 are not exactly, but pretty nearly replicated in the events of 2016, uh, as you can see. So those are agreements to differ. Now, the confidentiality principle is the third strand of collective responsibility. And the uh, idea here is that traditionally cabinet meetings themselves, uh, but also much more widely advice and discussions within government, were expected to be kept private or confidential. And the ministerial code still says that. Uh, and that is the general uh, obligation. Uh, having said that, we must admit here that this is a, an obligation that is much uh, furrier or vaguer or less well observed in its terms. Governments itself and ministers in governments uh, will sometimes be quite prepared to say what they're doing and why they're doing, as is only to be expected in a democracy. And so if it has the status of being a briefing, this is what the government is doing, uh, then that's perfectly all right. An interesting, so briefings are, are in a sense eroding the principle that things are being conducted in private and in secret. The slightly different connotation attaches to the word leak instead of the word briefing. Briefing sounds like it's a good enough thing to do, uh, whereas leaking sounds like something you shouldn't uh, be doing. Uh, and so there is that uh, slight uh, different connotation. So uh, a, a leak is uh, you know, a release of information which perhaps wasn't fully authorized or, or approved or, or sanctioned in that way. But nonetheless, those happen too. You can bet that an hour or so after a cabinet meeting, some ministers will have had lunch with some journalists. I wonder who's paying for the lunch. Uh, and you can bet that uh, in the next day's paper, there'll be uh, quite good, quite well-informed discussion about what happened at cabinet meetings and whether a, a view was generally taken or whether there were actually a number of dissenters and so on. And provided that's non-attributable, then uh, a lot of that can happen without anyone getting into particular trouble. The trouble may start if there is attribution or if someone uh, is clearly identified or is able to be quoted on those things. But the people who have these lunches generally understand the rules by which they're playing. And so they will often, the accounts will often be written in terms such as sources close to the minister tell me. Now that may well be the minister himself that, that told the journalist. But the journalist, in order to play the game and in order to have further useful conversations with that minister, is not going to attribute it directly to the minister in person. So there are actually a lot of leaks. Jim Callaghan, when, uh, after he'd been prime minister, he was once giving evidence to a, a select committee and he, he made the rather nice distinction, briefing is what I do, leaking is what you do. Uh, and, you know, there's, it's a little bit like uh, the, the conjugation, uh, um, um, I'm a convivial person, uh, you are a social drinker, uh, he is an unreformed alcoholic. You know, it's, it's that kind of uh, uh, <laughs> distancing or personalizing uh, that is going on in the distinctions between briefings and uh, leaking. On the particular matter of ministerial memoirs, which also comes up within this uh, area, you may remember that there was an important case called the Crossman Diaries case, or Attorney General and Jonathan Cape Limited, back in 1976. And that arose because one of the Labour ministers in the 1960s, Richard Crossman, had been keeping political diaries of the cabinet meetings and events of his day. He was well known to be doing that. About the issue or the crisis arose when these were actually ready for publication. And uh, w w was there going to be a, an official attempt by the government or someone acting for the government, the Attorney General as the government's law officer, would there be an official attempt to prevent the publication of those diaries by the book publisher Jonathan Cape. Sunday Times newspaper was going to publish uh, serial extracts as well uh, and so on. And that, that's the background to the Crossman Diaries case. And the Crossman Diaries case, if you remember, resulted in, in some ways a little bit of a score draw. 
the, the court would not issue an injunction to prevent the publication because the events being described in the first volume of the Crossman Diaries were things that had happened more than 10 years ago. So uh, the Crossman Diaries case can be used for one or two different things actually. It can be used to show that courts want to enforce constitutional conventions because the first thing the Attorney General had tried to argue was there's a convention of cabinet secrecy as part of collective responsibility. Will the court not enforce that convention? To which the answer from the Judge Lord Chief Justice Lord Widgery was a convention is binding in honour only. It is only an obligation of conscience. It is not a legal rule. So if that's all you're depending on, you've lost your case, Attorney General. I will not enforce that convention. So we can use the case for that, and it is important for that. The Attorney General then had a second string to his bow, which was to dredge up a somewhat obscure part of the law called breach of confidence that was usually used in order to stop people who'd worked for Coca-Cola taking the secret recipe off to some other drinks manufacturer and things of that kind. It had almost always been used in an industrial context of company secrets not being taken off to another company. But uh, it was decided in the Crossman Diaries case that it could, uh, it could actually be applied. Wherever someone had accepted an obligation to keep things confidential, the law would enforce that as a matter of law, the bre law of breach of confidence. So the, the, but the trouble with that was there's also a defense to breach of confidence in the law uh, of public interest. So the judge decides, well, yes, cabinet secrecy is protected by the law of breach of confidence, but after 10 years after the events, there's a stronger public interest in the public knowing in a democracy what government was deciding. And the public interest in disclosure was a stronger public interest 10 years after the events being described. So it's a little bit of a score draw in football terms, isn't it? It's, you know, there's something for everyone there. The, so the government is, is getting some protection for cabinet secrecy, but it's a time-limited protection that wouldn't last as long as 10 years. That was the decision on law. That's still the legal decision, I suppose, on that particular point. But the way that the government responded was to have a stronger code rule in the ministerial code and to make clear to ministers, and in this case people who have been ministers in the past, that for 15 years they're not free to publish things entirely freely. What they must do is for 15 years it must be submitted to the cabinet secretary. So the cabinet secretary could decide whether anything in the memoirs or accounts was damaging in some way to the general interests of the country or government and could ask for something to be excised or censored from that account. So actually ministers when they accept that they're under the terms of the ministerial code are also now accepting, this was a rule suggested by a little committee chaired by Viscount Radcliffe who had been a House of Lords judge and so the Radcliffe recommendations were for a 15-year uh, agreement to vetting 15 years after the events uh, under the Radcliffe principles. So that's the, the code rule that uh, is used now in this situation. Okay, let's move on to uh, individual responsibility. And uh, now this also breaks down into different uh, strands or subdivisions, but they're less there are less distinct uh, strands or subdivisions here. To some extent, these things shade into each other, but it is uh, possibly useful, or at least for uh, explanatory purposes, useful to think about three different, slightly different kinds of situations that we have uh, here. So uh, those are personal or private conduct, the actions of the minister in office, the actions of the minister as a minister, and the actions of the department. Starting with personal or private conduct, I mean, your first instinct might be to say, surely what's personal or private conduct is nothing to do with uh, government, nothing, uh, not, nothing that should be relevant anyway. And to an extent that's true. If someone, is, uh, if someone is gay or if someone is having an affair or something like that, then that would not nowadays be thought to be something that was uh, threatening or damaging to their ministerial career although it might have been different 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, but there are, of course, situations where the personal does become the public. You know, if a minister had committed some serious crime or something like that, then even though it's got nothing to do with his 
uh, performance as a politician or as a minister, it might nonetheless be embarrassing or raise doubts about the person's uh, suitability uh, as a minister. So there are situations where the personal does become uh, intermingled with questions of the reputation of government and the reputation of individual <laughs> ministers as part of government. So, for example, any corruption, uh, fortunately, corruption, I think, is fairly rare. Large-scale corruption, at any rate, is fairly rare in British public life. You know, minor scandals might be very common, but large-scale corruption is probably largely absent, uh, I think we can say. So there are, there are very few uh, instances of that. Uh, one, going back to uh, 1948, there was a, a minister in the Labour government, uh, unfortunately, named John Belcher, uh, and uh, he was a junior minister in the Trade Department, Department of Trade, and, uh, of course, the Department of Trade is in some ways concerned with businesses and contracts and things of that kind. And it was discovered that uh, he had accepted a gift from a businessman of a one-week stay at a hotel for him and his wife at a resort on the Kent coast called Margate. Ministers could be bought quite cheaply in those days. <laughs> So, uh, do you come from Margate? No, but I was there once. It was very nice. Okay. <laughs> I have to check. I'm not offending anyone from Margate. But uh, a somewhat, I think it's probably fair to say, it's a somewhat down market resort uh, in the uh, south of England. Um, you know, it's a bit like one of those competitions where the first prize is a week in Margate and the second prize is two weeks in Margate. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, that was uh, what was discovered in the case of Mr. Belcher, and uh, once it was discovered, he had to resign, as you might expect. Not really any instances of corruption of that kind in recent years affecting government ministers. You may, of course, think about and be very well aware of the expenses scandals that uh, surfaced uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so elements of malpractice on a a relatively small scale perhaps, but you know, people putting in claims that were rather dubious or exploiting the rules to the maximum extent possible and that kind of thing. In, in, and th these uh, problems uh, apply to a very large number of MPs, but, but in most cases o over fairly small uh, items. And in most cases, if they repaid the money, for example, for some claim they shouldn't have made, uh, then the matter was probably going to be overlooked by the party uh, the Parliament and everyone else, well, except the, some of the media, who have uh, made a great deal of, of these things. But in the worst cases, of course, there were aggravating circumstances of <laughs> entirely fictitious claims being made up uh, and things of that sort. So in a few cases, it did lead to uh, resignations uh, of, uh, uh, and, and other uh, sanctions. In the case of ministers, just to mention uh, a couple then there, uh, Jackie Smith, the woman who was the Home Secretary in Labour government of Gordon Brown in 2009, mainly really just carelessness over uh, some of the claims that had been submitted on her behalf. Her uh, you know, accounting system wasn't very good or something like that. Uh, they'd been rather carelessly handled. And they, in fact, included claims for some leisure activities, such as the renting of DVDs. And when a newspaper started digging into these and uh, to find a bit more information about them, some of the DVDs in question were actually pornographic videos that had been watched by her husband while she was away in London. <laughs> well, a chap's got to do something, hasn't he, on, when the wife's away. <laughs> uh, however, uh, this, was not, uh, this was not well thought of by, uh, by people and uh, was a factor, at least in her resignation. The Brown government was running out of steam in various other ways and she probably thought that you know, she mightn't have very much to lose anyway by resigning, uh, but she uh, did resign, and in fact she lost, there's always the electorate having their say, Jackie Smith lost her seat at the next general election. It uh, went to uh, the other party instead. Uh, so she fought, fought the seat, but unsuccessfully. Uh, David Laws was a Liberal Democrat minister in the coalition government in 2010 uh, uh, in the uh, financial uh, area, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, and in fact he'd been a minister for less than a month when uh, an expenses question arose in relation to claims that he had made. 
And in his case, the problem was uh, with regard to an accommodation claim. Uh, he had paid uh, quite a large sum of money over a few years, amounting to over £40,000, 40, uh, to his landlord. And if an MP has to rent premises in, in London, because their constituency is somewhere else, but they've got to stay in London for part of the week, well, not normally that would be uh, quite acceptable. Uh, but there are special rules if you're paying the money to somebody who is a member of your own family or something like that. And in this case, it was found out that Mr. Uh, Laws' landlord was actually his partner uh, as well. So uh, uh, he uh, resigned for uh, an inquiry to be held into that, uh, which uh, reported that there had been a breach uh, of the rules, reported uh, quite a, a, a time later. He, was event he eventually came back into the government in a, in a more minor role. Uh, so it wasn't a hanging offence, but it was a, a temporary, it was a resigning offence at the time, uh, anyway, while this was investigated. There can, of course, be other moral concerns of a non-financial kind, uh, sometimes uh, potentially quite serious matters. John Profumo, a well-known case from the 1960s, 1963. Uh, he was the Secretary of State for War, not a ministerial office that we have anymore, but in 1963 it was presumably thought that Britain might go to war at any point still, so there was a Minister for War, and that was his uh, function, obviously closely connected with matters of defence and security. Uh, well, the trouble is he began an affair with a model called Christine Keeler. So he was uh, sleeping with, maybe only once or twice, but he was sleeping with uh, Christine Keeler, uh, model girl, shall we call her. Uh, but uh, Ms. Keeler was also uh, uh, having sexual relations with a man called Yevgeny Ivanov, <laughs> as the name might possibly suggest. Uh, he was an attaché at the Soviet Embassy. He was a naval attaché at the Soviet Embassy, so almost certainly a spy, really. And uh, so uh, he, was, uh, he was sleeping with Christine Keeler as well. So there were possible security implications, aggravated by the fact that it had been raised uh, by a Labour MP in the House of Commons when people had got to hear rumours and Mr. Profumo immediately denied any impropriety or relationship or affair uh, with anyone. So, Perhaps the worst aspect of this was he had lied to the House of Commons, and uh, the House of Commons takes that very seriously. So uh, he, uh, when the affair came more fully to light through the activities of the British press, uh, he had to resign. He resigned as an MP as well as uh, resigning as a minister. Two things don't always go together, of course. A lot of these ministerial resignations have just been resignations as a minister. Often they will remain as an MP unless there is a particularly bad problem. More recently, in 2012, the Liberal Democrat Minister Chris Hewn had to resign. Uh, he had been charged with uh, uh, quite a serious offence of perverting the course of justice. What had he done? Well, his car uh, had been uh, found uh, speeding well over the speed limit. Uh, there were already quite a lot of penalty points on his uh, licence, so he was at risk of disqualification. In the car at the time were Chris Hewn and his wife uh, Vicky. But who was driving? The cameras didn't show. And at the time, it was presented to the authorities that Vicky was driving the car. Uh, she would not be disqualified because she didn't have any penalty points on her license. But uh, it later came to light that it had been the other way around. It came to light uh, when Chris and Vicky split up. <laughs> so it came to light through Vicky. <laughs> she was condemning herself to uh, to being convicted as well. So they're both convicted of uh, perverting the course of justice, but uh, it's a reminder that if you're going to do that, it's best not to fall out with your wife or partner uh, if you want them to stick to the story rather than, uh, th than to tell the truth. So uh, that's what we had there on personal or private conduct. Okay, actions of a minister in office. Now, this can be a, quite a wide range of quite different things, but there are kinds of misjudgment that uh, may mean that the minister is sacked or has to resign. Uh, as I say, very different circumstances in uh, all of these three, really. Hugh Dalton was a Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1947. Traditionally, the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, leaves his uh, house in Downing Street and carrying the bag with the budget speech, he goes off to Parliament. And as he did so in 1947, Hugh Dalton walked along the way from Downing Street to the Palace of Westminster with uh, a journalist that he was quite friendly with. 
you should always sup with a long spoon if you're uh, going out with journalists. Uh, anyway, um, the, uh, just by means of pretty ordinary chit-chat between the two of them uh, on the way from Downing Street to the House of Commons where about three or four hours later he was going to deliver the budget speech. Uh, there was a little bit of conversation between them. And when Mr. Dolphin got up in the Commons on the Labour side to start giving his budget speech, the members on the other side held up that late afternoon's copy of the London Evening Newspaper which already had in its headlines the main points from his budget speech. <laughs> now, there are various lessons from that, one of which is that newspapers were actually pretty good those days in producing a lot of editions of newspapers very quickly, within a few hours. Um, but uh, the other, I mean, the political lesson was, you know, that was regarded as a pretty bad offence because government policy is meant to be delivered first to the House of Commons, not to the media. Um, the current speaker is uh, quite sensitive and quite strong on that point. It doesn't always happen exactly as it should. If something's fairly minor, it might be released in other ways. But something as big and important as a budget speech, it was regarded as very bad that you know, the public generally and opposition members and others knew about the main contents of the budget just from a conversation uh, on the way with a journalist on the way to the, to the Commons. So, so Dalton uh, resigned. Edwina Curry, who was a junior minister in 1988 um, in Mrs. Thatcher's government, as it was at that time. Well, she was a bit unfortunate in a way. She was a minister for agriculture, and in a television interview, the, there had been a problem about uh, infect salmonella infection in, in eggs. And uh, so, so that fell within her department's area. And she really just used the wrong phrase. She had meant to say something like, where there is a problem of, in, of infection, it generally affects the whole of that farm. But she said it in such a way, by getting her wording wrong, that she made it sound as if almost all of British egg production across the whole UK uh, was affected by this problem of salmonella infection, uh, which of course had very serious financial results for farmers across the UK, many of whose, uh, uh, you know, uh, chickens, egg production, uh, were, were, were quite all right and shouldn't have been affected at all. So in a way a little bit unfortunate, but uh, a mistake that had important uh, and serious consequences for people involved. Uh, Liam Fox, now one of the leaders of the Brexit campaign. Uh, Dr. Liam Fox was the Defence Minister in 2011. Um, he had acted unwisely, mainly by allowing a friend called Adam Werity to accompany him on a lot of government business. Now, Adam Werity had been his best man. There's not, no suggestion there was anything improper in the relationship. Fox is a married man, etc. Uh, it's just that he allowed this person not only to get sort of too close to a lot of government business when he had no government position, but uh, Werity had actually started describing himself on, you know, with a name card saying advisor to the minister. And he had no official position. He was not a special assistant, he was not an MP or anything else. But here was the defence minister, Liam Fox, you know, attending meetings with, for example, the Saudi defence minister, and Adam Werity would be in the next chair to him. So things like that were just seen as he had crossed some lines and uh, acted inappropriately. And uh, following an inquiry by the cabinet secretary, he was asked to resign over that issue. Okay, now... As I say, these all shade into each other to some extent, but we're moving on now to actions of the department. In the old days, the classical, so-called classical doctrine of ministerial responsibility was <coughs> that if a government department was thought to have done badly in some respect, uh, then you know, the proper and honorable thing for the minister in charge, or any maybe some other junior ministers too, the proper and honorable thing to do was for the minister to resign. You know, my department has wasted millions of pounds of public money. Well, even though it had nothing to do with my personal decisions, I should really fall on my sword. I should take responsibility and resign. The uh, locus classicus of that is the Critchell Down affair. Critchell Down was a, an area of farmland in Dorset, which in 1939 the government uh, took over uh, for wartime use as a bombing range. But they did so under a promise that at the end of the war, assuming Britain was on the right side at the end of the war, that the farmland would become available again and could be bought back by the farmer who had owned it, who still owned neighboring land. 
What happens at the end of the war in 1945? Well, the Ministry of War or the Ministry of Defence passed it on to the Ministry of Agriculture, who decided that it would be nice to have a model farm so that children growing up in London who had never seen the countryside could go out and see how a farm works in Dorset. So the promise had not been kept. And this uh, took uh, quite some years to uh, drag on. It involved uh, several government departments, it involved a large number of ministers, but when it eventually came to a head in 1954, Sir Thomas Dugdale, who was the Minister of Agriculture in 1954, felt that he should resign over the matter. That was the classical doctrine. You might say it was also observed in 1982 when the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, and two junior ministers in the Foreign Office resigned when the Argentinian forces invaded the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. Carrington himself was not at fault. In fact, he'd warned his cabinet colleagues that withdrawing a British warship from the area might send an unfortunate signal. He was far from being at fault. Nonetheless, you know, as a matter of honor, he said, my department, the Foreign Office, failed to anticipate this, this invasion. We failed to uh, act appropriately and send forces there in good time and things of that kind, and therefore I, I, I insist on, on resigning. Mrs. Thatcher didn't want him to resign, but he resigned anyway, and some junior ministers with him. So it can happen, but uh, what has seemed to be the case in the last uh, 30 or 40 years is that it happens uh, less and less. So rather more common has been an avoidance of responsibility, even when there have been quite serious failures by ministers and their departments, or by departments with the minister at the head of them. So, for example, in the so-called Black Wednesday in 1992, the Britain had been part of a predecessor to the euro called the European Exchange Rate Mechanism, or ERM. So Britain had taken part in a, uh, a currency mechanism, the European Exchange Rate Mechanism. Um, in 1992, the Chancellor Norman Lamont uh, decided that, uh, uh, well, Britain actually had to withdraw. It wasn't faring well in this, but it only withdrew after he had spent about £11 billion in a futile attempt to support the value of the pound within the mechanism. So a very large sum of public money uh, was spent uh, in a way that was futile, and uh, in any event, there was then the withdrawal from the ERM and no further truck with European monetary projects. Uh, even under Labour governments of Mr. Blair and particularly Mr. Brown, uh, have kept well away from European uh, monetary projects uh, since that time. But Lamont, uh, didn't, who was a friend of John Majors, who was the Prime Minister at the time, he didn't feel any need to resign. Similarly, Michael Howard in the 1990s was Home Secretary when all sorts of things went wrong with prisons. Lots of prison escapes, uh, bad prison discipline, prison riots. Uh, disputes between the minister and the uh, prison service and its director. He eventually sacked the director of the prison service who then won in an employment tribunal as having been unfairly dismissed by the minister. None of this caused Michael Howard to resign. <laughs> Much more recently in 2012 there was a fiasco over the award of a franchise for the West Coast Rail Line, the main railway line going up the west uh, side of Britain from London to Birmingham, Manchester and Glasgow. Initially the franchise had been awarded to the transport company First Group. A rival company was Richard Branson's Virgin Group. And uh, when the Virgin Group began litigation it became clear that the officials in the Department of Transport uh, had really messed this up very badly and their award process was badly flawed with errors in calculations that schoolboy arithmetic should have told them were clear errors. And if the litigation continued, Branson would obviously have won. The government caved in. They uh, said that they would do it again. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's what's happened. But the transport minister, Justine Greening, is currently a cabinet minister in another department. So she didn't resign, didn't lose her job over that. That seems to have been in more recent years, uh, you know, a lot of uh, quite bad faults where ministers have in some way avoided or evaded responsibility. How do they do that? Well, they may do it by mainly these techniques. They may say it's, uh, I'm responsible for policy, but not for the uh, putting it into practice for the operations. Michael Howard was a particular master of this when in charge of prisons at the Home Office. Michael Howard's view was 
prisoners are bad people or they should be banged up and prison works. My policy is to keep them in prison. Nothing you can criticize there. Okay, the fact that they're all breaking out of prison, the fact that there are riots in the prisons, the fact that there are far too many people in prison, none of these things matter. They're nothing to do with me. That's all just the operational aspects. The director of the prison service is responsible for these things. Uh, I'm not uh, responsible for, for those. I'm only responsible for the top level policy. <laughs> Very convenient. And another way is to say, I will take accountability in the sense of I will answer in Parliament for the things that are going wrong. I will say what has gone wrong. I will say what has happened. I will say how it happened, perhaps, and that uh, some civil servants who might or might not be named uh, will, be, uh, will be blamed for this. But that doesn't mean that I take any personal responsibility. This has nothing to do with me, Gov. So uh, distinguishing between personal responsibility and explanatory accountability is another technique. Now, this might make us actually quite skeptical about whether the need to resign is still there as part of the sanction. Uh, and uh, a well-known article quite a long time ago from a political scientist called Sam Finer uh, said that, uh, in his view, okay, there's a circle of actors that have some role in this. It matters what the political party thinks. It mat might matter what the opposition thinks. It matters nowadays what the media thinks. It matters particularly what the Prime Minister wants to do or to not do. But he said, you know, the main thing is not any particular actor in this process. The main thing is just political expediency. Uh, what is convenient for the government of the day, what they can get away with, uh, these are the things that are most important in practice, rather than the nature of the fault itself. Well, you can uh, resolve that by saying that the sanction is not part of the conventions. You can say there are, there are, there's ministerial responsibility, there's uh, an obligation to do things as best you can, but the, the need to resign is not, strictly speaking, part of the convention. That's one way out of it. The other way out of it is just to say that conventions are more flexible. They're not like legal rules. And so you can't uh, tabulate in exactly precise form uh, when resignation will be necessary or not. How did this change if it did change under coalition government? Well, with coalition government, uh, most of the principles actually operated in pretty much the same way, at least formally. So from 2010 to 2015, we had coalition government, as you know, with the Liberal Democrats in office along with the largest party, the Conservatives. And generally speaking, the same principles were applied. We've seen that a uh, Liberal Democrat minister like Mr. Hewn or David Laws, they had to resign in appropriate circumstances, just as a Conservative minister like Liam Fox had to resign in appropriate circumstances as well. And the only difference that really appeared there was that the circle of actors became <coughs> necessarily slightly enlarged because, as well as the Prime Minister, there was the Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, as the leader of the second party, the Liberal Democrats. And especially if a Liberal Democrat was involved, then he would clearly have to be consulted over this. And it wouldn't just be a matter of consulting him over this, it would also be a matter that the coalition agreement had something to say on, because the coalition agreement agreed on the number of Liberal Democrat cabinet ministers, being four, and the number of Liberal Democrat ministers in the government. So actually when Mr. Hewn or Mr. Laws as Liberal Democrats have to resign, it's not a free choice for the Prime Minister to promote some Conservative uh, minister, junior minister that he likes. It would really be a matter where the decisive say would be uh, with Mr. Clegg as the Liberal Democrats party leader because it would have to be another Liberal Democrat who was appointed in his place. So when David Laws had to resign, Danny Alexander steps up from the Liberal Democrats to uh, uh, become Chief Secretary of the Treasury in his place, and so on. So in that slight way, the circle of, uh, uh, of actors was extended a little bit, but that's a difference of process rather than a uh, difference of principles. With collective responsibility, the confidence principle was still in effect. If a government had been defeated, many people thought the coalition might not last five years without uh, losing on a vote of confidence. Many people thought that uh, the coalition might split up, uh, uh, but uh, that didn't actually happen. So the confidence principle was still in effect. The confidentiality <coughs> principle was reiterated. As we've seen, it doesn't work perfectly by any means, but it uh, works to some extent. 
uh, and that was reiterated in the ministerial code. The one area that uh, is going to be clearly different was the unanimity principle. The unanimity principle was restated and applied, restated in the ministerial code and applied, but it was applied subject to negotiated exceptions. When the two parties, Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, uh, agreed to the coalition government, part of that agreement was that there would be certain issues, okay, there would be many issues on which they would fall in and come to the same view, or sometimes would not try to do anything because it was impossible, such as having a British Bill of Rights. Uh, there would be many issues which they would either agree on or agree to leave aside, really. But there would also be some issues which might well come up in the scope of a five-year parliament where they knew that agreement would not be possible and so it was better to legislate for or to agree that there should be uh, disagreement uh, on these matters. So there were negotiated exceptions in the coalition uh, agreement on a half dozen areas on defence, on the nuclear deterrent aspect of defence, where some Liberal Democrats would not have gone along with the Conservative view. Probably they went through five years without actually having to vote on, on that or pass any legislation on that uh, anyway, because it's only now being looked at uh, uh, again at the moment after uh, the coalition government has ceased. On energy, with civil nuclear power, there might be somewhat different views. So defence, energy, electoral system in the planned referendum. Remember in 2010 it was uh, our, an intention that there would be a referendum on the electoral process for the House of Commons with people having the opportunity uh, in the referendum to vote for the alternative vote system to be brought in rather than the first past the post system. The referendum happened and the uh, view of the, those who voted, 42% uh, turnout, the view was to uh, stick with the existing system by quite a large majority. But Liberal Democrats were not expected to toe the same line as Conservatives uh, on that particular issue. Uh, the effect of marriage in the tax system. There isn't much effect of marriage in the tax system, but the Conservatives have had this thing about it's better to reward marriage. There should be some advantage uh, for people who are married rather than simply living as partners. Liberal Democrats didn't agree with that. Conservatives were able to make a very minor change in that respect. University funding is something where uh, it was also a negotiated exception. There could be different party views on university funding, but in fact they've simply left that as it was throughout the period of the coalition government anyway. <laughs> so actually some of these things didn't actually arise, but they were negotiated for in the, uh, in the agreement. Uh, what perhaps hadn't been expected so much, but what did transpire, was that it also happened that if, if, in, if in fact it turned out if in fact it transpired that it was impossible to maintain unity across the two parties on some other issue, then all the Prime Minister did was announce uh, an ad hoc, you know, at the time, or even retrospectively the next day, uh, add this to the list of things on which the two parties didn't have to agree. So actually uh, that happened uh, on, on uh, two or three occasions. It happened with, refor with regard to the reform of constituency numbers and boundaries which was also put in an act of 2013, but the Liberal Democrats would not vote to bring it into effect. Uh, now it's being brought back. So the, the Conservatives' plan was to reduce the number of House of Commons constituencies from 650 to 600. And that would involve some redrawing of boundaries, of course. Uh, that was put in an act of 2013, but the act needed to be brought into effect by subordinate legislation being passed through the two Houses of Parliament. Liberal Democrats, because they were in the huff, they were unhappy about the vote on the referendum and they were unhappy about the failure to reform the House of Lords. Liberal Democrats uh, were in the huff on those things and they, they felt the Conservatives hadn't played fair by them, so they were not going to assist the Conservatives in this uh, reduction of the number of constituencies from 650 to 600. So that's back on the cards now, but it was off the cards in 2013 and when it became clear the Liberal Democrats wouldn't uh, support the Conservatives on that. Mr. Uh, Cameron just added that to the list of things. Okay, these are things that we're, we're not agreeing on. So actually what you have here was not a fixed list, but a, a list that was itself amendable. And what you have is, you see, if you like, you could add this to the earlier slide. This was another agreement to differ. This was an institutionalized agreement to differ over the period of the coalition government. 
that extended to half a dozen named things and then was added ad hoc to two or three other things where in fact the parties proved unable to agree on a particular point. The bedroom tax was another of those. The bedroom, so-called bedroom tax, which is a reduction or variation in benefits, in housing benefits in certain circumstances where people are held to have a extra or spare room, so to speak. Uh, that was uh, conservative policy and it was coalition government uh, policy that put it through. Liberal Democrats voted for it when it went through. When it came back on a motion on that particular point, uh, Liberal Democrats then were, had changed their mind and they voted against it. But, uh, but it's already in the law. So uh, that, that was uh, the case there. Uh, so that's what we had with the coalition government. That's a pretty thorough look, I hope, at ministerial responsibility. Just to turn briefly to another uh, area, uh, as I said at the start, ministerial responsibility consists of a group or set or cluster of constitutional conventions. And it seemed to me that ministerial responsibility is actually pretty good for exemplifying, uh, well exemplifying the characteristics of constitutional conventions uh, in this cluster of rules. I'm taking as a standard definition very similar to that offered by many other authors, but the political scientists uh, Marshall and Moody in their book uh, Some Problems of the Constitution defined it this way, rules of constitutional behavior which are considered to be binding by and upon those who operate the constitution but which are not enforced by the courts. So those are constitutional conventions. What are their main features? They're not court enforceable. They are rules. They are rules of some importance to our understanding of how the Constitution works, uh, but they are not rules that a court will enforce. Courts work with laws. Conventions are non-legal rules, so they are not court enforceable. Uh, constitutional conventions, although they are not enforced by courts, are in some way treated as obligatory. They are treated as binding by those to whom they apply. They don't apply to us. They don't apply to the general public in any circumstance. There's no constitutional convention that applies to the general public, although laws apply to the general public. But uh, constitutional conventions apply to constitutional actors. They apply to the Queen, they apply to the Prime Minister, they apply to judges, they apply to parliamentarians, and so on. And in some way they are treated as obligatory, aren't they? Even although they're not court enforceable. And there's a distinction to be drawn between those that are obligatory and those that are merely habits or practices. The Prime Minister might have the habit of going off every weekend to a country house in the Chiltern Hills called Chequers that uh, some eccentric person left for the use of British Prime Ministers to enjoy as a country house at weekends or for holidays. That might be his habit, but it's not a constitutional convention. We wouldn't criticise it as unconstitutional if a Prime Minister doesn't go there. It might be the habit of the chance of the exchequer when he's going to deliver the budget speech and leaving his house in Downing Street. It might be his habit to hold up the document case that contains the budget papers so that all of the newspapers can take a photograph of him doing so. That's a habit, but it's not a constitutional convention. It's not obligatory, is it? He's not going to be criticized for acting unconstitutionally if he doesn't do it. So they are, um, they are rules that have the, the quality of being obligatory. They're not, just, they're not just optional. You'll be criticized if you don't do these things. If the Queen doesn't give the royal assent to a bill passed by the Houses of Parliament, you can bet that she'll be criticized and you can probably bet that it's going to cause a constitutional crisis. It might lead to changes in the law or it might lead to changes in practice or something else. But they, they, there are, so I don't, think you can, I don't think anyone bears attempts by Jennings and others to say, why do people obey conventions? Well, I doubt if you can sum it up in any phrase or even a sentence. There's probably a variety of circumstances and a variety of things that would happen if people didn't obey conventions. But in some way, they are rules that are obligatory. And they are flexible. When you write down laws, they're written down in particular formulation, and that formulation of laws can then be adjudicated on by official bodies called courts and they can be enforced by courts and authorities. Those qualities don't apply to conventions. They're not written down in any authoritative form. We might find them written in documents like the ministerial code and other things of that sort, 
but there's no body that has the task of being, we are the people that can adjudicate on these things, and we are the people that enforce them. There is no corresponding apparatus of secondary rules, uh, as you have with uh, legal rules, uh, in the case of constitutional conventions. And that flexibility, of course, can be an advantage, because if circumstances change, then the conventions can change as well. Whereas if it's a matter that's in a legal rule, then you might need to change the law, which could be time-consuming or difficult to do. So there are advantages in that flexibility. The uh, textbook writer S.A. De Smith, 20 or 30 years back, put it neatly by saying that if you make these conventions into laws, you would purchase certainty at the expense of flexibility. You would make them more authoritative, more certain, more precise, uh, have somebody able to adjudicate on them, but you would lose the flexibility that goes with them. Okay, so I would suggest to you actually that ministerial responsibility is pretty good at typifying constitutional conventions. As we saw in the Crossman Diaries case, if asked to, doesn't often happen, but if asked to, a court refuses to enforce them. They are non-legal rules, they're not court enforceable. Are they obligatory in some way? Well, the actions of the actors resigning like Callaghan on the vote of confidence, like Robin Cook on dissenting from the government line, on profumo on a matter of personal response. <laughs> the actions of actors would suggest strongly that in the right circumstances they are obligatory, but at the same time they're flexible. We see that the principle as once understood can change. It can be narrowed as was the confidence principle. You can have a rule but you can also have exceptions from the rule, which we dress up in the phrase agreements that differ, uh, as we've seen. And the adjustment for coalition government uh, was, as I say, a kind of institutionalized agreement to differ. You can have a waning or a changing of the classical doctrine of taking responsibility for a department's actions. Let's just briefly, in the time remaining, um, we've got a few minutes still, not many, let me uh, very briefly say what I think about two or three exam questions in this uh, sort of area. Um, this question was actually in 2013-14, the uh, new chief examiner for public law set a specimen paper, and uh, this is from there. Uh, question seven was, discuss the nature and importance of the doctrine of ministerial responsibility to the working of the British Constitution. I hope you would think that that's a pretty straightforward question really what I would call a bookwork question. If you've done the, if you've done the work, if you've learned the, the material, uh, there's, there's nothing tricky about the question. It's not even asking you to take a critical edge or anything of that sort. It is just an excuse to write down what you know about the doctrines of ministerial responsibility and their importance for the working of the Constitution. So I, I hope that that's pretty straightforward. You would be rewarded for the knowledge that you show in the time available. Let's take another question from 14, 15 years back, but you know, this subject doesn't change all that much in some areas at least, and in this area it hasn't uh, changed radically. Um, in 2002, one of the exam papers had the question, to what extent is it possible or desirable to define clearly the conventions of individual and collective ministry responsibility? Now this is, I would say, not too different from the last one. Again, it's largely a bookwork question and you're being invited again to discuss both individual and collective responsibility. But there's a slight extra edge or angle here, isn't it? Particularly in the words desirable. So to what extent is it possible to define clearly the conventions? That would incline you towards not only describing the conventions, but pointing out how they're rather furry at the edges, how they can be flexible, how they can be narrowed, how they can change in different circumstances. There are good things about that, but there may also be bad things about it as well. What about the word desirable? Would it be desirable to define clearly the conventions? That maybe in, should incline you towards an extra paragraph. Perhaps the line I just gave you from S.A. De Smith, you could purchase certainty at the expense of flexibility. That might be one disadvantage of defining them, mightn't it? You, you can define them more clearly, but if they are then applied, this is to some extent a question of whether you make them into laws as well, isn't it? And if you do, then one consequence is you may actually lose some of the flexibility and some of the advantages that you otherwise get from them. Any other disadvantages that might flow from making them into laws? 
some of you may be thinking along these lines that, well, some of these are in a very political field. Whatever we think about Mr. Cameron's appointments or sackings or whatever else, it does seem essentially political, doesn't it? If we don't like what they do, we can chuck them out and have the other party. But it's probably not the kind of thing we want judges interfering with. So maybe they typically, or many of them at least, reside in a political sphere. And perhaps we wouldn't want to judicialize. Perhaps we wouldn't want to bring in legal processes into all of these areas. So I think the desirable word is taking you a little bit towards that territory, although many of the marks for that question would still be very straightforward in the, uh, as I say, bookwork kind of approach. Now this question from 2015 is, I think, stepping up the uh, critical angle a bit more and is going back to a point that I made near the start, which was to say, usually this is a very good thing and it uh, operates as a kind of sword, but this is also asking us to think about it as a shield with the word uh, undermines. So in many ways it enhances government accountability to Parliament, but notice that some aspects operate more as a shield than as a sword. The confidentiality that governments, even if not perfectly or very efficiently, the confidentiality that they try to preserve over things like cabinet meetings and some other discussions, well, to some extent that's operating as a shield where they're not, there's not full disclosure to the public of what's happening. They're using that to shield government. And when they use their majority to protect a minister like Michael Howard or Justine Greening or whatever minister's department is not doing very well at the time, and the opposition party will probably say the minister should resign. But the government may well choose, if this is the prime minister's decision based on political expediency, the prime minister may say, no, you stay, you stay with us. You stay with us. We will use, you know, we want, there might be a motion on this. There probably want to be a motion leading to a vote. But even if there was, it's not for the House of Commons to decide whether a minister decides. The House of Commons is the legislature. The government is headed by the prime minister. It would be the prime minister's decision in the end uh, on that question. Slight warning with the final one. Again, from a different paper in 2015 from the uh, Zone B or uh, Far East paper. Different uh, papers being set in different uh, hemispheres of the world. Uh, and uh, the question here was evaluate the effectiveness of the parliamentary procedures by which government ministers are held accountable for decisions, actions and policies of their department. Is this a question of the same kind? Some of you might have looked at this and thought, yes, this is just about ministerial responsibility as well. And certainly the word ministers appears and the word accountable appears in this question. But be careful. What is this question actually focusing on and asking you to do? I think a discussion of ministerial responsibility would get you a few marks. It might get you five out of 20, but it wouldn't be a pass mark if I was examining this question and you write about ministerial responsibility and nothing else. This question asks you to evaluate the parliamentary procedures. The parliamentary procedures are things like question time, debates, and select committees. That to me is the main emphasis of this question. Now those are the mechanisms by which ministerial responsibility is being put into effect in the arena that is Parliament. But be careful to read the question. Is it about the mechanisms? Or is it about the background theory of ministerial responsibility? Or maybe it's both. But this question has a heavy emphasis on the mechanisms. And if I were examining, that's what I would be, be looking for in this case. It's a bit different from the others. And it's there as a little bit of a warning to read questions carefully. There are some examiners who are fairly relaxed about this. And just like any display of knowledge in something that appears to be roughly the relevant area. But there are other examiners who do take quite seriously the wording of the question and who will expect you to respond to that particular wording of the question rather than to produce some kind of stock answer that might have been for a different question from the year before or something like that. Well, we are more or less out of time. Any questions very quickly? Yep. Is there any reference for the sword and the shield? Uh, not really. That's uh, my uh, suggestion of the metaphor. But you will find that probably emphasized more in some books than others. Uh, probably the textbook by Elliot and Thomas, I would suggest, is maybe the best in that respect. Music